is Kip Fast. I'm president of the Peace the Yard Regional Arts Council and wanted to begin by acknowledging our gratitude to uh, Treaty 8 on whose land we live and work in northern BC. It's my honour to do the introductions for today's session. And one of the advantages of doing it online is that I was able to sit in on the recording earlier and found it to be a very thought-provoking and valuable discussion. Uh, one of the roles of the Arts Council is to promote all forms of creativity in the region and I just wanted to emphasize that this particular uh, discussion will be a valuable uh, resource for any artist in the region regardless of what you're, you're participating in, whether it's visual arts, uh, music, uh, or ceramics. So please let your friends know that they should uh, listen in. Our first participant, participant is Helen Knott. Helen is a uh, Deniza Nehaluk writer, uh, spoken word poet, uh, and advocate for the uh, Prophet River First Nations and lives in Fort St. John, BC. Helen's first book, uh, In My Own Moccasins, was published in the fall of 2019 uh, by the uh, University of Regina Press. Helen will be acting as a moderator for this session. Um, Sala LeBay is a mixed race black writer, um, musician, professor, um, and organizer. El Sonnet is of Afro Guyanese, Indo Guyanese, and Quebecois descent. Uh, Sonnet has published three collections of poetry uh, A Stranger Leaf, Colarno, and Sonnets Shakespeare. Sonnet lives on Vancouver Island and is a professor of creative writing and English at uh, the Vancouver Island University. Um, please enjoy this session. So I spent some time with your book over this last month and I was taken through a range of subjects throughout your sonnets from love to beauty to gender to race and then to where all of these things intersect and there was the inclusion of missing murdered indigenous women and then on the other side uh, a beautiful sonnet that focused solely on prince and i've been listening to november rain a lot so i really appreciated that so thank you for joining us today sonnet thanks helen thanks for taking the time to read my book i'm so stoked that that you read it, that you read it. Yeah, I took away a whole bunch of quotables and I've made, like I posted one picture on social media, but I made some other ones. Like there was this line towards the beginning, I'll get to the questions in a minute. But, and it was, if I can call, or if I call the country boys uncouth, they'll just be proud. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it was right at the beginning you had me. Um, so we're here to discuss primarily two questions, and then I have an add-on for the, the ending. And the first one being, how can poetry grapple with how some cultures assume the place of others? Um, well, I think that that's, that that's the central, it's one of the central questions of the book. And uh, as far as grappling with being a settler, being a mixed race black person on, uh, right now I'm on Snanaimuk territory. I was born um, in Toronto. So uh, there's a number of, a number of nations that are, or peoples that have had stewardship of that land. And my parents are now on um, the Hall Demand, what was the Hall Demand tract? Um, I think that, I think that my, my work has grappled with who gets, who, who says what this place is, right? Not even, and like, who even gets to define place was a central question for me 
from before I started to write poetry, right? Mm -hmm. As I experienced um, these strange exclusions for no reason, like that when I was young, I was like, what is the reason for this? Because if like skin color doesn't seem to be as like, doesn't seem to be enough because that's how people would explain it, right? And I was like, yeah, but we don't do that for eye color, really? We sort of don't do it for hair color, though we sort of do. And then it's like, we, we with big quotation marks around, around that. Um, so knowing, trying to figure out my, my situation in the places that I was in and who was saying what the place was and who ran it and who, whose it was, uh, was always a concern of, of mine. As, as far as um, how poetry can grapple with it, I mean, there's so many different ways, so many different poets, so many people who've been writing um, in their own traditions, right? Um, and speaking stories and preserving stories as a way to, to be on whatever land. And uh, so just writing is one way to, to deal, I guess. For me, I tried to use a form that would speak to how hard it is, mm -hmm. right? Like just trying to come up with sentences to, to tell a story, to narrate a story about my feelings around it or my lack of language around it uh, isn't enough. So for me, poetry and being able to try and come up with a little formal thing, like conceit throughout the book that, that helps me to do that uh, was, was one thing that I could, that I could do. And so the way that I try to take, like what place, quote unquote place, Shakespeare uh, occupies in my, in my psyche was one way I was thinking about it. And then another way of thinking about it was the, the way that uh, his ink takes up space on the page and how I wanted to occupy and take, you know, sort of, Occupy was happening when I first conceived the book, like those movements. Mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to do that, but also also not not succeed entirely. It's not like I want to just um, use the master's tools to like, you know, yeah. <laughs> just as the master's tools. <laughs> yeah, I, I was. I, I think I was trying to to, to show. Um, where my like what I felt my tools were and to show the limits of just trying to um speak louder than than all the things that have come before me mm. I know I for one appreciated it because as a young girl there's a section in my book that talks about it too where I was like obsessed with Shakespeare and I would read his work all the time and memorize passages. And I remember my dad taking me to like a Northern production of The Taming of the Shrew, but I was always looking for myself in this literary world, right? Where I wasn't reflected back. And in order to um, imagine myself in these spaces, I had to change who, like the identity of myself to see myself reflected in them. So in my imaginings, it was always like, well, you know, to take part in this, or because I was a fan of like 1950s culture, but like you would have to be, you know, Caucasian and probably like mid to upper class to, you know, be a part of this, how you are reading about it or what it looks like. So I was really appreciative of that. When I read your work and then I read an interview you did previously, you used the, the term, um, the crowding out of voices or of other voices. I think that was your term. I hope it was yours and not the interviewer. <laughs> um, and that made me think of Claudia Rankin uh, and her book, Citizen. I went back to it last night and I was looking and she said uh, on one of her pages, like, 
I feel most colored when thrown against a sharp white background. And, you know, if that background is a Canadian, like, literary scene, if we're just focusing in on, on Canada, um, would you say that, you know, in the recent years that the background isn't so white anymore, that there's more voices? Or how do you see that shift taking place today? Uh, definitely. It's definitely, it's shifted. Um, I am thrilled that I now have a sense of writing to a diverse audience, or I can picture myself writing uh, not to a, a white gaze, right? And, mm -hmm. and still feel and, and know that I will have an audience. So that's, that's different than when I, than when I started out. And it was a habit. It's, it's a habit. I still have to check myself sometimes. I'm like, who am I, who am I writing for? And what kind of um, assumptions am I making? I remember, uh, I remember writing for the Globe and Mail. I, I did some, some reviews when I was just starting out and I would deliberately, like I reviewed Austin Clark's book for, for, for one, uh, jumping to mind and I remember s specifically saying our ancestors or our like to say that you know Austin Clark's writing about this black woman in Toronto and I said our grandmothers because I thought you know fuck it like somebody else would say our grandmothers about some old Scottish lady right mm -hmm. and not worry about it being in a national paper but when I did it I was very aware that I was like oh most of the people reading this or not are going to be like this Caribbean lady is not my grandmother but I was very conscious of trying to um speak from this place of yeah we're, we we uh have black grandmothers right mm -hmm. but uh, I and I think that that's 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 an early way of thinking about it now um background is the wrong word but but the way that my education first thought me taught me to think um, of a of a white ideal reader and and white um, Eurocentric values on on literature, and then with with Canadian narratives also brought in this multiculturalist narrative that suggested that immigrants, non European immigrants, are somehow going to work hard and get to ascend to Euro, like that kind of power mm -hmm. was really prominent when I was starting out. Plus a whole bunch of like, there's, there's stuff that I cringe in my early work that's pretty like speaking, speaking for others. Uh, but to understand the land that I'm on um, is the most important thing, I think for everybody here. And so to say, I think like that's part of the question of the book is if if I feel most black you know or feel most colored from the art I think it's a different artist and I'm forgetting their name that Claudia Rankin is like she's she's putting their art in her work so um but against a against a stark white background what do I what do I feel against the land mm -hmm. right when when I know that's my ground and uh, I have uh, European heritage, I'm mixed race, and I have black heritage, and I have South Asian heritage. Yeah, and I think it's just interesting, like this concept, not concept, but the reality of land and then place and um, language and how those interact. Because when you're looking at place names, right, and the rewriting of, of history, and how you can throw a name on, on something and that history kind of falls to the wayside. Um, because so many, so much of the time, place names include history within it. And it's almost this like continual overwriting. So when you're understanding place, that, that language piece comes, comes into it or knowing what the, the names are for, for places because then that kind of usually gives you some insight into what the stories could be or um, 
especially because place names I know here from what my my grandma or my asu told me um you know they're just they're descriptors they're not exactly names but they'll tell you like oh midzeli sis that's bad mountain why is it called bad mountain <laughs> so then you you know you have the the stories that go, go alongside with that and there's this challenge uh within like being an english speaker and writing in english and that leads us to the the next question so how can english speaking writers use the English language to challenge the legacy of colonial literary values? Uh, if I, if, if I had like a great answer for that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, <laughs> you know, had to write the book. Um, yes. I think that I, it's a question that uh, I want to, to continue to raise, or at least that matters, that matters to me, right? Mm -hmm. That, um, even just speaking French, which is just like next door practically, uh, as far as the like language uh, etymology goes, and being aware of the space between those languages and what's untranslatable. And I lived in Korea for a while and uh, learned to speak some Korean. And in Korean, the the tenses or the, the the syntax of the sentences is is different and i remember it being explained to me like like this uh so at the end of korean sentences like a basic korean sentence has a particle for the subject and then a particle that you tack on to the end for the object and then you say those two things and then you say the verb and it was explained probably by now that i think about it a, a european descended linguist but I think I heard this as well from like Koreans there um, that what that does is it privileges the relationship between the two things so you say you like if this is speaker it's like sonnet subject speaker speaker object C and to them like that 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 puts those two things there and then and then names the relationship between them as a as a way of like organizing the concepts in your brain yeah. as opposed to english which would go i see the speaker where i'm the actor i do something to this passive speaker mm -hmm. right so just that blew my mind around like the conditioning of the mind by a language and um, add to that that languages grow in relation to the land around them, that, that like words are, you know, invented in order to express the sensual relationship between the body that's, that, that's there and the thing that's, that's there. Um, you know, we've got this tool that's, that, that grew up in Europe has a whole bunch of like Latin shit happening in it to uh, over here trying to trying to use that syntax uh, to express relationality here and I think it, it expresses um, it expresses a colonial relationship like it grew it grew with the actions of of the consciousness that's rooted in in Europe, so I think it's very hard to um, express an African rootedness, a mm -hmm. rootedness, and I cannot. I have to hear from indigenous writers in English about what's going on for them and their rootedness or not rootedness or displacement, right? So. Would you say then that um, learning about another language or learning how another language is structured and maybe some of the words would help you? Because it sounds like learning about another language brought awareness to you about the constraints of English and how it's formed relationships, right? There's that whole um, I think it's the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, where it's like uh, 
language shapes how you experience the world, right? So um, would you say that then people should try to learn other languages? I know that that's like a hefty thing to plop up somebody. Not maybe not try, but you know, to have awareness because it it highlights your relationship with language in the world. I def definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, I've learned a little bit of Halkaminum. I just, you know, as far as settlers, I'm sort of just jumping to like settlers learning indigenous languages, right? And, and language revitalization and preservation and um, which, like absolutely, absolutely uh, led by the folks who have the language to to sh to teach, right? And um, I guess because like I I I didn't I didn't grow up speaking French, so my when I was in grade three. Uh, so I was like, I guess a precocious, precocious reader, precocious kid, um, reading the sonnets at seven. Like, uh, it it was from that class in grade three where I was like, you know, I was smuggling my book, a little sonnet book, to school and like fucking off in my mind from math mm -hmm. class because I I knew what was going on and I was bored and so I would read, and then from there they were like, what are we gonna do? Because I'd skipped a grade already, so I was like seven years old in grade three but I lived in a very small town in Manitoba at that point and like attached to the same building was the all French school. And because my dad uh, is like Franco-Ontarian descended from Quebecois and he was, he, he himself uh, did not speak English until started at five. Um, then I went into French school. So I've spoken French for quite a long time. Uh, the, that sense that just that sense of the way that that living in another language is an an entire paradigm it's 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 a, it's like a an operating system in your body that um that filters your your physical sensual experience right and everybody who's monolingual i just kind of like how it's hard for me to under it's hard for me to to imagine monolingual monolinguality like just living in english alone or any any single language um without having given a ton of thought to um the embodied experience of of living in another language and what mm -hmm. that what that must what that does to you. And if you've got two languages, then those gaps are, are palpable. And I think it's phenomenal to, to like consciously experience your world kind of with those in the space between those two maps. Mm -hmm. Just, it just, I don't know, for me, it just shows, it just, means that I'm aware of the limits of the tools that we have to describe the world. That you can't, you can't believe in any particular truth in a literal way when, the, the la when language as a tool is, is, is only a tool to map our, our experience. I was um, reading, I don't remember the name of the book, but it was Jessica J. Lee, and it was her most recent book. And she incorporates a lot of language as she returns back to like her mom's and her grandparents' home in Taiwan. And she talks about change in language too and how that kind of built these barriers between her and her mom. But even just in, in reading that book and looking at translations and it's this opening into the world and how the world is experienced. Like for example, island, um, the symbols for island translated to bird on a mountain because it was to like signify isolation, right? And I was like, how beautiful, like to be able to even just get insight provides that, that bit of shift too. And when you're talking, I was reminded of my, of my grandma um, who was a fluent speaker in, in Danaza. And it took her quite some time to, to teach me. 
And even now, like I only have a really basic knowledge and working knowledge of, of Danaza, but when she was teaching me and I was like, well, what does that translate to? And she's like, I told you already, like, this means rainbow. And I'm like, no, but like, I know that Kwan means fire, but what does Kule mean? Because she would just translate it to English and not give me like, well, what does this, this mean? And we would have this back and forth and maybe it would be a week later. She's like, oh, this is what it means. Like, so Kule Kwan, which is um, rainbow means uh, thunder, or fire rope. And fire rope fire rope nice so yeah just those those little things that kind of um sneak away so uh in sonnet number eight in your book you asked what music would sadly sweetly sound your last second and i was wondering what music would perfectly or messily sound your present rather than your last ah that's a nice question. That's, I think that's uh, actually sort of where I'm living these days. I feel like if the, the book was like brought me to the limit of, of what English as, a, as the music, like when if you think about poetry as, as language that's not just being used for its um, semantics, but is being used very specifically or very like um, explicitly for its musicality. Uh, I am now trying to figure out how just non-semantic music expresses what I've got, what I've got to say. It's a big, it's a, it's a journey and frustration in the sense that if I've got an instrument, my instrument is language. Mm -hmm. And, and still is, and like, and, or the computer or something like that, right? Um, other instruments, even my own, even my own voice are uh, a whole other journey of 10,000 hours to, to be able to play in a, in a way that expresses um, things with the nuance that I've, I guess I've had the experience of being able to express myself with, but I'm writing, I'm writing songs. And so I would say that my present my my present is uh, is those those songs that I'm that I'm writing and discovering, having the same kind of lovely uh, experiences of discovery that, for me, um, kind of fuel the writing experience, where you you sit down and you might have an idea of what you're what you're going to explore, but sometimes you say things that you didn't expect to say that you didn't know you were going to say. And then once it's there on the page, you're like, is that, do I mean that? Did I want, is that there? Is that true? And you're like, yeah, actually, cool. Yeah, I did mean that. I love that. So your music of, of the present is like in the language of now and not left to, up to the interpretation of other people. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to find my own, yeah, whatever that is. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sonnet, for spending time today and for sharing some words. I am really grateful to have been able to share space with you. I am so grateful uh, to have been read by you and to have this conversation. It's really um, a highlight of the, the whole experience of having written it. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Now that, that, that Helen's brought up, um, number eight in the book, then maybe I will read, uh, I will read, I will read that, that poem. It's a little, um, it's a little bit on the longer side. Um, and so for anybody who's uh, watching this and not actually familiar with what I did in the book, um, Sonnets Shakespeare takes each of the uh, sonnets and writes over them, like this, the crowding that we're talking about, that we met, talked about. Um, I, I erase uh, Shakespeare, instead of deleting, doing erasure po poetry by deleting, I erase by sticking my letters um, in and around the, the text of the original. For example, if, um, if the first word of Shakespeare's sonnet was the I could put an M on the front and an R, E R on the end, and or no, M O on the front and an R on the end, and start with mother, or stick an R in the middle and an E on the end, and start with three. And so the the word is there, the Shakespeare text is there, 
but my word uh, makes it hard to hear and see. So sonnet, sonnet eight, uh, Shakespeare's sonnet eight. Uh, I'll just read the first four lines of it. Because uh, this one is actually, I guess, pretty inspired by or like speaks in relation to the original sonnet. So music to hear, why hearst thou music sadly? Sweets with sweet war not, joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly, or else receivest with pleasure thine annoy? Okay, so that's some of the Shakespeare that's uh, buried or not buried, kind of interwoven um, with this poem in the book. Uh, where I imagine the moment before I die. And I hope this happens, I'm not gonna bank on it, but I would imagine, I just want that flash of like my whole life, but, but the music too, particularly. What music if just before the grim reaper swings his scythe, you hear the playlist that tracks your life? What music would sadly, sweetly sound your last zeptosecond? With sweet emotion in my swan songs, I'll hear Slipknot and Jesu, Joy of Man's Desiring, the delights of Nirvana and Joy Division. Whitney Houston's greatest love will scritch scratch to CSS and superstition. I'll be the gratefulest dead chick when I check out to Hotel California and every other guitar standard I decimated while I lived. Stone Temple Pilots will intro Gladys Knight, Billy Joel, and Run the Jewels. Then a tribe called Red will give sway to Bowie, to the pleasure of They Might Be Giants, R.E.M., and Annie Lennox. Fat Boy Slim and Fleetwood Mac will send me off to the truth of harmonies, the concord of well-tuned sounds that Moby, Run DMC, and Neil Young composed will remind me, not of carefree times, but of radical goodness, moments of Fender Stratocaster shined ear glitter. PJ Harvey, Radiohead, and the Butthole Surfers will make the list, Loverboy, Chilliwack, Death From Above, and The Who. I count the Four Horsemen and Gertrude Stein sound recordings, the Violent Femmes, Snow, the four-part chorus that Beethoven put in the Ninth Symphony, U2, Lord, and the Beastie Boys. I realized the sacred as a kid when I remarked how one string vibrates with another, how emotion thrums to bandwidth. Like forks attuned to one another, we strike sound in each other. And in each other's music, the body subjects itself to the mutual order. As I'm going, going, gone, I'll long for the White Stripes, James Brown, Lincoln Park, and the Rolling Stones. I'll rage against the dying and the machine as distilled refrain condenses in that happy moat, hearing Amy Winehouse, The Clash, and Kate Bush all in one harmonic, in one pleasing note. Mums made us promise to sing Yellow Bird and Bohemian Rhapsody when she's gone to Skye's speechless song. Que sera, sera, we bewailed our flown grandma. Public Enemy and Pink Floyd, seeming one will sing in my last hymn. My life's talking heads will K dot. The universe vibrates its nth acoustic above what a single Will's verse might prove. There's love if you want it, don't sound like no sonnet, sang Kuti, sang Bjork, sang the Verve.